For most people, breathing normally comes effortlessly, so they take it for granted. But for millions of others, this vital life function can be as taxing as running a marathon. These people have a chronic pulmonary disease, such as asthma, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis. For them, even a simple activity, such as a walk in the park, can present a challenge. For example, this patient developed an asthma attack while gardening. She was admitted to your unit with dyspnea and wheezing, which resolved with treatment. As you assess this patient, you notice that her dyspnea has returned, along with diaphoresis and anxiety. You recognize these as signs of an acute asthma attack and work quickly to improve her breathing. But are you confident in your knowledge of the pathophysiology and effects of asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis? Can you provide complete and accurate care for patients with these disorders? And do you know how to help them avoid complications and improve their quality of life? This program will show you how. It will relate the pathophysiology of these three disorders to their signs and symptoms. And it will demonstrate how to intervene effectively and confidently for your patients with chronic pulmonary diseases. A chronic inflammatory disorder of the bronchial airways, asthma affects more than 22 million Americans. And its prevalence is growing, especially among those in poverty-stricken and urban areas. Today, asthma is the second leading cause of preventable hospitalizations. The disorder commonly strikes children, usually beginning before age 10. However, it also affects adults as a recurrence of the childhood disorder or as a new one. A patient with asthma typically has exacerbations or acute attacks and remissions. An exacerbation can result from various factors, including treatment noncompliance and exposure to triggers, such as stress, pollen, or other irritants. Exacerbation factors typically lead to mucosal edema, bronchospasm, and excess mucus. Unless treated promptly, an exacerbation can lead to airway obstruction and severe respiratory distress. Normally, air moves easily through the upper and lower airways into and out of the lungs. During inhalation, air passes through the trachea and enters the right and left main stem bronchi. Then it enters the bronchioles, the narrow subdivisions of the main stem bronchi. The trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles stay open, in part because they are supported by cartilage embedded in their smooth muscles. The terminal bronchioles, however, don't contain cartilage, so this part of the airway can constrict and collapse under certain conditions. The terminal bronchioles divide into lobules, or asini. These lobules consist of alveolar ducts and sacs that allow gas exchange. Asthma typically affects the mucosal lining of the bronchi and bronchioles. This lining has three layers, the epithelial layer, the basement membrane, and the lamina propria. In the epithelial layer, goblet and clara cells produce mucus that prevents irritants from entering the lungs. When irritants enter the bronchioles, they immediately stick to the mucus. Then, tiny finger-like projections called cilia propel the irritant-laden mucus up toward the pharynx for expectoration. During an asthma exacerbation, a trigger causes mast cells and T lymphocytes in the lamina propria to release inflammatory substances such as histamine and leukotrienes. When these inflammatory substances attach to receptor sites on the bronchial lining, 
the mucosa becomes inflamed and swollen. Then eosinophils, macrophages, and neutrophils migrate to the inflamed area. These cells increase mucus production, slow the cilia's movement, and damage the epithelial layer. When the epithelial lining is damaged, the mucosa overreacts to triggers, causing bronchoconstriction. That's why asthma is called a reactive airway disease. If pollen or another allergen triggers the exacerbation, inflammatory substances cause plasma cells in the lamina propria to release large amounts of immunoglobulin E, or IgE. This antibody has four effects on the lungs. It increases vascular permeability, causing airway inflammation, damages the mucosal epithelium, leading to airway hyperreactivity, stimulates neural reflexes, resulting in bronchoconstriction, and causes cells to produce more mucus that's more viscous and can form plugs. Whether an exacerbation is caused by an allergen or another trigger, it leads to airflow obstruction from airway inflammation, constriction, and mucus plugging. During an exacerbation, a patient can inhale some air through the inflamed, swollen airways to reach the alveoli, but on exhalation, the intrathoracic pressure rises, closing off the airway completely. This traps the air, causing some alveoli to hyperinflate. Other alveoli fill with mucus and collapse. Because many alveoli either are hyperinflated or have collapsed, less gas can be exchanged across the alveolar capillary membrane. If you suspect your patient is having an acute asthma attack, assess her rapidly so that treatment can begin promptly. First, quickly determine the extent of her respiratory distress and oxygenation. Check her respiratory rate, which is likely to be rapid. This can result from anxiety, which causes the release of epinephrine, or it can stem from hypoxemia, when the low blood oxygen level sends a signal to the receptors in the aortic arch and carotid arteries. These receptors signal the brain's respiratory center to increase the respiratory rate and depth, and this increases the blood oxygen level. Also check for use of accessory muscles for breathing. Because pulling air in and pushing it out of the bronchioles and alveoli takes extra effort, the body will recruit additional breathing muscles. So your patient may use her sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles during inhalation and her abdominal muscles during exhalation. Remember to inspect your patient for diaphoresis and cyanosis, or bluish skin and mucous membranes. Diaphoresis results from the release of epinephrine. Cyanosis occurs when the blood's hemoglobin loses oxygen. Next, listen to your patient's lung sounds. You're likely to hear sibilant wheezes during expiration. These high-pitched sounds occur as trapped air moves through narrowed airways. You may also hear sonorous wheezes or ronchi. These sounds result from vibrations that occur when air moves through mucus-filled airways. Finally, place your patient on a cardiac monitor. You may note tachycardia caused by the release of epinephrine. You may also see arrhythmias, which can be triggered by hypoxemia or increased lung pressure. After assessing the patient, prepare her for diagnostic tests. First, draw blood for arterial blood gas, or ABG, analysis. When the results are ready, review them. When an exacerbation or acute attack begins, the patient breathes rapidly to draw in more oxygen. This can alter ABG levels, producing a blood pH above 7.45, revealing alkalosis, a PaCO2 below 35 millimeters of mercury, 
reflecting hyperventilation, and a PaO2 of 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury, which is normal. But as the attack progresses, too little oxygenated air reaches the alveoli. Then ABG levels may include a blood pH below 7.35, revealing acidosis, a PaCO2 above 45 millimeters of mercury, reflecting hypercapnia, and a PaO2 below 80 millimeters of mercury, indicating hypoxemia. If ordered, prepare your patient for a chest X-ray. During an acute attack, an X-ray is likely to reveal increased residual lung volume and alveoli enlarged by trapped air. When your patient's condition is stable, review the results of her pulmonary function tests. These tests evaluate airway obstruction and treatment effectiveness. Pulmonary function tests suggest airway obstruction when their results include a low forced vital capacity, or FVC, which is the amount of air that can be forcefully expelled from fully inflated lungs, a low forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1, which is the amount of air expelled during the first second of the FVC, and a low or reduced mid-expiratory flow rate, which is the average air flow rate during the FVC. Once an acute attack has been confirmed, prepare to administer treatment, including oxygen, a bronchodilator, and an anti-inflammatory agent. First, administer oxygen by nasal cannula or mask to maintain an oxygen saturation of at least 95%. Then expect to administer an inhaled bronchodilator, such as a beta-2 adrenergic agonist or anticholinergic drug. Beta-2 adrenergic agonists, such as albuterol, stimulate beta-2 adrenergic receptors. This dilates the bronchioles, which lets more air move through them. Anticholinergic drugs, such as ipratropium, block cholinergic receptors and displace acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter that constricts smooth muscle and increases mucus production. When given through a nebulizer, anticholinergic drugs dilate the bronchioles and reduce mucus production. To reduce bronchiolar edema, expect to administer an anti-inflammatory agent, such as intravenous methylprednisolone, or another corticosteroid. Corticosteroids work by blocking the migration of leukocytes, such as eosinophils and macrophages. They also reduce the inflammatory effects of histamine and other substances released by mast cells. Once the acute attack is under control, expect the physician to follow the six steps developed by the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program. Step 1, an inhaled short-acting beta-2 agonist, such as albuterol. Step 2, an added inhaled corticosteroid. Step 3, a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid, plus an inhaled long-acting beta-2 agonist, or a medium-dose inhaled corticosteroid. Step 4, a medium-dose inhaled corticosteroid plus an inhaled long-acting beta-2 agonist. Step 5, a high-dose inhaled corticosteroid plus an inhaled long-acting beta-2 agonist and possibly omalizumab for patients with allergies. Step 6, a high-dose inhaled corticosteroid plus an inhaled long-acting beta-2 agonist plus an oral corticosteroid and possibly omalizumab for patients with allergies. As needed, alternative drugs may be used in steps 2 through 3, such as a mast cell stabilizer or an antileukotriene in step 2 or both in step 3. Mast cell stabilizers such as chromalin prevent mast cells from releasing inflammatory substances. They also halt eosinophil migration. 
Anti-leukotriene drugs, such as Zephyrolucast, prevent leukotrienes from attaching to receptors. This reduces airway edema and inflammation, as well as mucus production. Now suppose you're caring for this patient. He was admitted earlier today for treatment of respiratory distress caused by an acute exacerbation of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. As you take his health history, you learn that he has smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for the past 30 years. Of course, you know that smoking contributes to emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Here's how. Emphysema may result from a deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin, a plasma protein made by the liver. Normally, alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibits elastase, a proteolytic enzyme that lung cells release in response to inflammation. A congenital defect can cause an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So can cigarette smoking which depletes the stores of this enzyme. Without sufficient alpha-1 antitrypsin to inhibit elastase, lung tissue is destroyed. Four pathophysiologic changes occur in emphysema. They include loss of elastic recoil, airway collapse, alveolar hyperinflation, and bully formation. Loss of elastic recoil begins when proteolytic enzymes break down elastin and collagen fibers in lung tissue. This causes the lungs to collapse easily and prevents full recoil during exhalation. Because of this, air gets trapped in the lungs. Airway collapse occurs when the patient must use accessory muscles to force trapped air out of the lungs. This forceful exhalation raises the intrathoracic pressure, which collapses the terminal bronchioles. The collapsed airways trap air inside the alveoli, expanding them beyond their limit. This causes alveolar hyperinflation, which impairs gas exchange. Hyperinflation and proteolytic enzyme damage lead to alveolar destruction. Bully formation occurs when the destroyed alveoli coalesce to form large blister-like structures. These bully protrude from the pleura, making the lungs look irregular and bumpy. The bully can crowd out the remaining healthy lung tissue, further impairing gas exchange. Patients with emphysema may also develop chronic bronchitis. Like emphysema, chronic bronchitis strikes many smokers. That's because cigarette smoke causes chronic inflammation of the mucosal lining of the bronchi and bronchioles. Over time, the mucosa thickens and the goblet cells multiply in the epithelial layer. To try to rid the irritants from the lungs, the goblet cells produce large amounts of thick, tenacious mucus which tends to form plugs. In addition, the chronic inflammation destroys some cilia. With fewer cilia to propel irritants from the lungs, inflammation and mucosal thickening worsen. Eventually, the thickened mucosa causes chronic airway narrowing and mucus plugging. Together, these factors lead to airflow obstruction and alveolar hyperinflation. If you are caring for a patient with emphysema or chronic bronchitis, be sure to perform a thorough assessment. First, observe his general appearance. You may find characteristic changes related to his disease. Your patient may appear undernourished because chronic dyspnea burns extra calories and makes food intake difficult. He also may have a barrel chest. Normally, the chest's anterior to posterior, or AP, diameter is about half of the transverse diameter. In emphysema, the diameters may be equal. 
This change in shape occurs because the lungs are hyperinflated and the accessory muscles of breathing are overdeveloped. Your patient may also display finger clubbing. This swelling of the distal phalanges results from chronic hypoxemia. Next, observe your patient's breathing. He's likely to show dyspnea with little or no exertion. He may lean forward in a tripod position to help his lungs expand more fully. And he may display pursed lip breathing. This breathing technique, a characteristic sign of emphysema, involves pursing the lips while exhaling. It lets the patient prolong exhalation, which helps expel trapped air. Now palpate your patient's chest wall using the palms of your hands. You may feel increased tactile fremitus. In chronic bronchitis, Fremitus is increased because sound waves must move through fluid or mucus. And this increases the transmission of their vibrations through the chest wall. Next, measure your patient's diaphragmatic excursion, the distance that the diaphragm moves between inhalation and exhalation. Emphysema typically reduces diaphragmatic excursion on both sides during exhalation. That's because it forces the lungs to remain hyperinflated after the air has been expelled. Now, auscultate your patient's lungs. You may hear sonorous wheezes over the bronchi, especially if he has chronic bronchitis. These adventitious breath sounds occur when air moves through mucus-filled airways. You may also hear diminished breath sounds at the periphery of the lungs. That's because, in emphysema and chronic bronchitis, destroyed alveoli and collapsed airways reduce the amount of air that moves in and out of the terminal bronchioles and alveoli. Next, listen to your patient's heart sounds. You may hear an accentuated P2, the pulmonic component of the second heart sound or S2. This occurs in emphysema and chronic bronchitis because lung stiffness and narrowed airways increase the intrapulmonary pressure. And this rise in pressure forces the pulmonic valve to close briskly, increasing the loudness of the sound it creates. In a patient with chronic bronchitis, you may also hear S3, a sign of heart failure. Right-sided heart failure, or core pulmonale, occurs because the right ventricle must contract forcefully to overcome high pressure in the pulmonary vessels. Over time, this weakens the right ventricle's walls, which causes blood to stagnate on the right side of the heart. When blood reaches the overfilled ventricles, it abruptly decelerates, causing the ventricle's walls to vibrate. This vibration causes S3, a soft sound heard immediately after S2. Next, prepare your patient for diagnostic tests. A patient with emphysema or chronic bronchitis is likely to undergo a chest X-ray. In a patient with emphysema, the X-ray may reveal bully and a diaphragm flattened by hyperinflated lungs. In a patient with chronic bronchitis, it's likely to show an enlarged or distended pulmonary artery and right ventricle. Also expect your patient's ABG levels to vary, depending on which disease plays a bigger role in his condition. In the early stages of emphysema, ABG levels may be normal. That's because inhaled air can diffuse across the alveolar capillary membranes of the remaining healthy alveoli. As long as gas exchange can occur, the oxygen and carbon dioxide levels stay normal. In later stages of emphysema, ABG levels may include a PaCO2 slightly above 45 millimeters of mercury, reflecting carbon dioxide retention, and a PaO2 between 60 and 80 millimeters of mercury, 
indicating a low oxygen level. The ABG levels change because advanced emphysema destroys many alveoli, leaving too few for effective gas exchange. This causes hypercapnia and hypoxemia. In chronic bronchitis, ABG levels worsen further. They typically include a PaCO2 of 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury, reflecting carbon dioxide retention, and a PaO2 of 45 to 60 millimeters of mercury, indicating a low blood oxygen level. In chronic bronchitis, hypercapnia and hypoxemia tend to be more severe because inflammation and mucus production obstruct the large and small airways. So too little inhaled air reaches the alveoli for gas exchange to occur. When the PaO2 level falls below 50 millimeters of mercury, look for signs of respiratory failure, a dangerous complication of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. A low blood oxygen level signals the brain to increase the respiratory rate and depth. At first, this helps raise the oxygen level and lower the carbon dioxide level. Eventually, the diaphragm and other breathing muscles become fatigued. When this happens, the respiratory rate and depth decline, which can lead to respiratory failure. If your patient with emphysema or chronic bronchitis develops respiratory failure, prepare for endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. Expect to increase the ventilation setting to lower the carbon dioxide level and plan to administer enough oxygen to return your patient's blood oxygen to his usual level. Also expect to administer drugs to reduce bronchoconstriction and airway edema. You may need to administer a bronchodilator such as albuterol, and an anti-inflammatory agent, such as a corticosteroid. After your patient is extubated and removed from mechanical ventilation, he'll probably receive an oral or inhaled bronchodilator, such as ipratropium. He may also need an inhaled corticosteroid, such as flunicilide, to decrease airway inflammation. If your patient has bullous emphysema, he may need surgery. In lung volume reduction surgery, the surgeon removes bullae and areas that have lost elasticity. This reduces the lung's total volume and helps them expand and deflate more efficiently. After this type of surgery, most patients have reduced dyspnea and improved activity tolerance. No matter which pulmonary disease your patient has, individualize your nursing care based on his condition and prescribed treatments. But expect to perform these general nursing interventions. Check the patient's vital signs at least every four hours. Adjust the oxygen as prescribed. If you detect signs of respiratory failure, prepare for endotracheal intubation. Establish and maintain IV access to administer drugs such as methylprednisolone and administer a bronchodilator such as albuterol by inhalation. When your patient is ready for discharge, review all the information he'll need to manage his disease at home. For example, teach him how to do the peak expiratory flow rate test. Explain that this at-home test uses a handheld peak flow meter to measure his maximum flow rate during forced exhalation. Advise your patient to call his physician if the peak flow rate falls by more than 20%. His physician may need to adjust the drug regimen. Also be sure to provide instructions about drugs, including their dose, side effects, and special considerations such as using a spacer with an inhaler, home oxygen therapy, helpful breathing techniques, such as pursed lip breathing, dietary guidelines, such as eating small, frequent meals, 
and avoidance of exacerbation triggers such as smoke or pollen, and arrange for a referral to a pulmonary rehabilitation program to improve your patient's activity tolerance and provide psychological support. Whether you're caring for a patient with asthma, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis, you need to understand the disease's pathophysiology to provide the best possible care. With this understanding, you can recognize and manage complications, successfully treat an exacerbation or acute attack, and intervene effectively to help ensure your patient's prompt recovery. By using this knowledge in your practice, you can plan your care with a fuller, deeper knowledge of its effects. And you can help your patient with asthma, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis continue this care successfully at home.